Hello, everybody. This is our December 2021 edition of Big Questions, Big Ideas. I'm Joe. I'm the uh, liaison for the Ball State Department of Department of Philosophy, and this is going to be our talk on Racing Fargo. We're joined here today with Dr. Jennifer Erickson, the Associate Professor of Associate of Ball State University's Department of Anthropology. And she'll be discussing with us tonight on why refugee resettlement and immigration is beneficial for small cities. Dr. Erickson, you have the floor. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much to the Muncie Public Libraries and to the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies for inviting me tonight. Um, I hope to have a, a lively discussion here. I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, I want to talk uh, today about refugee resettlement, broadly speaking, and then I'm going to talk about uh, my research in uh, primarily in Fargo, North Dakota, as well as Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, and use some lessons from those cities who have been resettling refugees for quite a long period of time um, and how uh, Muncie could benefit uh, from that. Uh, that process. And so I want to talk a little bit about immigration and how how immigrants and refugees are both similar and different. Uh, this is just the, the copy of my book here to the, the left. So I will talk about the definition of a refugee, uh, a bit about the process of how refugees come to the United States, how municipalities like Fargo uh, work uh, to support their new neighbors. Um, and then I will end with talking about uh, the Muncie Afghan Refugee Resettlement Committee, which some of you have heard of, uh, and I have been doing some work with. So first, the legal definition of a refugee um, is that a refugee is any person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and is unable to or owing to such fear is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. I read that whole definition because it's a complicated political and legal definition that people, individuals and groups must be able to prove these aspects uh, that they have survived uh, this kind of persecution. Um, and I just want to note, and I won't be talking about it uh, probably for the rest of the talk, but there's a couple of really important categories that are missing from this legal definition, and that is gender and sexuality. So uh, a lot of times when people are seeking asylum in other countries, including in the United States, if they have been persecuted uh, because of their gender or because of their sexuality, they usually have to prove that it's their membership of a particular social group, uh, like being a woman or being gay or trans um, that would uh, fit into that legal definition. Um, and then the other thing to point out here is that um, refugees are only one category of international migrants, of course. Um, and uh, to be a refugee, you have to cross an international border. And I am going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, so the differences between refugees and immigrants for anthropologists is that there's not as much of a difference. The reason why I'm going to continue to use the word refugee today is because I'm talking about a group of people who are legally um, identified as refugees or humanitarian parolees, and I'll talk about that more towards the end. Um, um, and, and, and it's oftentimes seen and portrayed that immigrants have more choice in leaving their country than refugees who are forced. And in some cases, that dichotomy is very clear, but in other cases, it's really not clear. Um, there are a lot of people who leave their country, such as those at the southern border um, uh, with the United States and Mexico who have come from Haiti, uh, Ecuador, Venezuela, Guatemala, uh, that are, are experiencing large scales of political violence. But because of politics, they're not allowed to be deemed the bona fide refugees. Um, and so that concept of choice is really murky um, in these discussions. And I just wanted to point that out before going uh, further, but I only have so much time. So I'm going to primarily be talking about people who are considered to be bona fide refugees, um, while also arguing that probably more people can and should fit this definition. 
So right now we're seeing more and more refugees um, all over the world, um, but uh, 82.4 million people have been forcibly displaced. And you can see uh, by the numbers here that refugees are actually in blue here at the bottom. Um, there's quite a few more internally displaced people, but because they haven't crossed an international border, they're even more insecure because they don't have uh, the same kind of uh, rights to asylum in a country that refugees do. Um, and um, I mean, you can see some of the political uh, influences here that Venezuela kind of a, appears on the map just in the last few years due to their political situation uh, that I won't get into right now. So who's hosting these countries with refugees? Uh, primarily the countries next door. So of course, if people are fleeing war, they're gonna, they're gonna run to the closest place that they can find safety. Uh, so Turkey is a huge uh, place where a lot of Syrians and Iraqis and Palestinians and others are living. You can see here, Colombia, Pakistan, Uganda, uh, people are fleeing there from the wars uh, in the surrounding area. Germany has taken a lot of the world's refugees in. Um, primarily, a, a lot of them are coming from Syria and the Middle East right now. Um, but 85% of the world's refugees are in developing countries. They're not in these Western uh, countries. Only 15% are developed and less than 1% get to the United States. Um, so I'm an anthropologist and in anthropology, we study what it means to be human. We study humans in all times and in all places. So we look at history from a very long perspective and we work all over the world. So in my work with refugees, we, you know, the question is what does being a refugee, what is the category, the political and legal category of being a refugee tell us about being human? And it says a lot about the nation state. Um, I think uh, it might feel to uh, people that the nation state is a new, uh, or a, th that it's a category that's been a lot around for a really long time, but it's actually a pretty new category of social organization. Got it, um, you got it, you got it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I bet Joan didn't. Yeah, I bet you didn't either. Okay, I'm going back. Is it still playing? Well, Jean, Jean, yeah. you're oh. you're not muted. <laughs> That's my aunt. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so um, in order to become a refugee, you have to cross an international border, um, and so you have to be denationalized. Um, and this is a huge, uh, this is a huge step. And I think it speaks a lot to our contemporary culture. Um, refugees are sort of like the canary in the coal mine, if you will, um, as we're seeing increased refugees uh, around the world due to uh, violence, political persecution, uh, of course, global warming and climate change. We, we're seeing climate refugees. Um, and that results in changing ideas about home um, and the scale of home from the place that you are currently to the place that you came from and the places uh, everywhere in between. Um, and so I chose this painting, uh, a recent painting by um, um, a refugee from uh, Syria, uh, whose name is Mohammed Al Amari, who uh, designed this painting, and so uh, you can have in the back of your mind these ideas about what what home means. So this is a history of refugee resettlement to the United States since 1975, and I wanted to try to get back to 1975 because that's uh, the year that we uh, admitted uh, around 130,000 uh, Vietnamese refugees uh, who uh, fled when the United States left Vietnam and there was the fall of Saigon. And um, it was another huge, uh, large scale humanitarian parolee situation where the United States government was like, okay, all these people helped us in the war in Vietnam, so we need to accept them to the United States. And we're seeing something similar with Afghans today as the US military left Afghanistan and Kabul fell to the Taliban. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of these things, but what I will say here is that in 1980, President Carter uh, came up with the, the Refugee Act of 1980. And the idea was to depoliticize refugee resettlement because understandably perhaps Refugee resettlement tends to you know, benefit the host country. The idea is that, well, you helped us and we'll help you. And President Carter was saying, you know, this should be more of a humanitarian organization and less of a political organization. But what it resulted in really was this kind of calculated kindness. Uh, and we have primarily 
Uh, for a long time after, uh, once the Cold War started, we have been helping refugees who vote with their feet against communism. Um, that's been the case for a really long time. Um, and now recently against uh, terrorism perhaps, uh, but we've also been accepting more uh, refugees who are Christian. Uh, so there's a religious basis uh, for some of this. Um, and if you want to look at a timeline of refugee resettlement, um, there's some great links at the USCIS, which is the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service um, that I won't get into um, today. Um, but I will point out here that you can see um, that these, uh, the blue category here is from Europe. Uh, that would include Bosnians in the 1990s, uh, former Yugoslavs who would be voting against their, with their feet against communism. A lot of refugees from Asia uh, due to the Vietnam War and other political crises there. And more recently, uh, the um, refugees from Myanmar and Burma have been coming to the United States. And there's very few refugees from Latin America, which I would like to point out is highly politicized because the United States has just not deemed Latin American countries um, worthy, if you will, of refugee, bona fide refugee status. Um, and so that is something I'd be happy to address in questions if people want to talk about that more later. And it's only recently that uh, refugees from Africa have been coming, and that's in part due to, um, I think, uh, accepting Christians um, like uh, Southern Sudanese and Somalis. So my, my research that was in Fargo, people have asked why Fargo? Why would you go to Fargo? Um, so many good reasons to go to Fargo. Uh, but first of all, um, it started with my background in Sioux Falls. Um, in uh, 2001 to 2002, I worked as a case manager for Lutheran Social Services Refugee and Immigration Program. Um, and this is where I began learning about refugees. Um, in the late 90s, I lived in Bosnia-Herzegovina, where I learned a lot about war. And when I came back to the United States, I was looking for a way to, um, uh, you know, a, a career, basically. And I spoke Bosnian, and so I found this job at a refugee resettlement agency that was still resettling Bosnian refugees. And it was a really nice transition for me. Um, I eventually went to graduate school in anthropology, and I thought about writing my dissertation about refugee resettlement to these small Midwestern cities near where I grew up. But when I went back to Sioux Falls to say, hey, I would love to write a dissertation about refugee resettlement here, I didn't get a lot of support. And I think it was because I had already worked in the system and maybe I knew too much or something like that. Um, but they were like, you know, you should actually go to Fargo. Fargo's an even better place. And I said, okay. And Fargo welcomed me with open arms. And I had a very positive research experience there. And the other reason is that there was um, a very long history of refugee resettlement to North Dakota. North Dakota has been resettling refugees since 1946. They brought a lot of Germans who were fleeing Nazi Germany. Um, uh, uh, I think um, not as many Jews were brought to North Dakota, which is a whole other history that I won't get into, but um, I think there might be some anti-Semitism involved there. Um, and then they continued uh, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and until the late 90s when uh, more than 600 Bosnians and Somalis and Cubans and Haitians and uh, refugees from all over the world were brought to Fargo. Um, and the city started to say, whoa, that's, that's too many. And I thought, okay, I wanna, I wanna study that and see what that's about. So there were increased numbers of refugees in earlier decades. More refugees were staying in the region than ever before. Um, and on a nationwide level, the uh, refugee resettlement agencies were transforming from a kind of fully volunteer organization to a more structured organization with paid staff, higher accountability measures, um, and things like that. And I was interested in studying more about that. And then my other interest is in public partner, uh, public private partnerships. Um, so here are the number of refugee arrivals just to Fargo. And you can see here in the 80s, these are going to still uh, be some Vietnamese, Cambodians, Hmong, um, and they were coming to the region, but then they would leave pretty quickly um, because they would hear about better services elsewhere. 
um, in the country, places with better uh, interpreters, the school system was more equipped for this number of refugees and so on. Um, and then we get into um, 91 and 92 when Bosnians were coming um, and it just starts to kind of increase. And the peak um, uh, happened in 2000 when um, uh, more than 600 refugees were resettled to Fargo and the city was just, um, basically an outrage. The schools were saying, we can't take this many refugees. The welfare agencies said, we can't take this many refugees. Um, the general public started to um, wonder who these people were, whereas before they were kind of blending in and not standing out too much. Um, and so um, I wanted to, to look at those public-private relationships. Why was the resettlement agency continuing to bring refugees when the city was so against it? Um, and then after 9-11, a lot of refugees were not allowed to come into the country, um, even though none of the 9-11 hijackers were uh, in the United States on a refugee um, on status. They were all here on student visas and work visas, um, but refugee resettlement took a really hard hit, but it did rebound. Um, and in Fargo, an increase in resettlement happened again in the teens, but this was a different political era. And I'm gonna talk about the differences between these two time periods in Fargo and, and what Muncie can learn from them. So just in case people are not familiar with the Midwest over further to the West, Fargo is up here. Um, a lot of people understandably think of Fargo in Minnesota, but it's actually a city in North Dakota, but it's right on the border with the sister city of Moorhead, Minnesota. Um, and then Sioux Falls is where I worked uh, before I did my research in Fargo. And I'm from a town down here, Laverne, um, which is about 30 miles, 30 miles from Sioux Falls. Um, so as an anthropologist and someone who has lived and worked abroad, um, I wanted to challenge the idea that anthropologists should work abroad um, and instead wanted to turn my anthropological lens on my own people, so to speak. Uh, but first, I want to acknowledge that for millennia, this region has been home to uh, a lot of different Native American nations, the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota Sioux nations, as well as the Assiniboine, Chippewa, Cree, Blackfeet, Crow, or Ojibwe, and the three affiliated tribes of the Mandan, uh, uh, excuse me, the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arakara. And so the map that I have in my book, and I wanna thank my colleague, uh, Colleen Murray, who suggested this, um, and Angela Gibson at Ball State Libraries, who put this map together, um, because this shows you all of uh, the, the contemporary Native American nations that are in this region. You're not gonna see a map like this in Indiana because Indiana was further west and they were they, uh, the settler colonialists and US military were more effective in pushing all of the Native Americans out um, towards Oklahoma. So so um, even though Indiana is home to the Miami and Delaware peoples, um, there's not a lot of them living in um, Indiana today as much as there are Native Americans in this region. And they are um, the largest minority population outside of whites in this region. And I think it's important to acknowledge them because a lot of people in Fargo and in Sioux Falls will compare refugees uh, who are referred to as new Americans there to Native Americans. And of course, the um, the non-adjectivized American. American is, is referred to as the white people. Um, and I'm trying to problematize that a bit. Um, so uh, this region's only been home to the white Europe, European Americans for about um, 200 years. So uh, let's look at the culture of Fargo a little bit. That's gonna tell us how uh, refugee resettlement operated there on an everyday level. Um, as I've already mentioned, it is a region of settler colonialism. Um, as an anthropologist, I look at settler colonialism as an ongoing process. It's still happening, it's not complete. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to, to talk more about that in uh, the questions if anybody wants to. Um, it is also primarily a Christian part of the country, and that um, uh, comes out in everyday ways. Um, culturally, there is a phrase called North Dakota nice. I think some of us have probably heard Indiana nice, Midwest nice. Um, and I really saw this as a pronounced cultural attribute that refugees were um, somewhat baffled by, um, this concept of niceness. Um, the climate, of course, we need to address in Fargo. It's uh, the, the coldest of the contiguous uh, states um, here. And 
um, it, it was pretty shocking for people coming from sub-Saharan Africa to fly to Fargo um, and, and experience that uh, 20 degrees below zero. Uh, people in Fargo think uh, very, very highly of their work ethic, and that idea is bolstered by their uh, very long-standing low unemployment rate. And in fact, in 2008, uh, during the Great Recession, um, North Dakota didn't even really feel it at all because of the oil that was discovered in the western part of the state um, and because uh, young people were leaving but refugees were coming. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a, a barely a blip in their screen, really. And then whiteness and white supremacy definitely um, is present in Fargo and will be uh, experienced by refugees there, in addition to uh, support and friendship which I'll talk about as well. So um, in the early 2000s, when uh, refugees really started um, amping, um, amping up to Fargo, uh, there, the population was primarily white, but today it's more like um, uh, 85%. So it's really uh, changing there. And the dominant ethnicity of the, the white people in Fargo is uh, very Scandinavian. Uh, I come from a long line of Scandinavian people, which is why I put the Norwegian flag here. Um, and uh, that is part of the whole niceness culture comes from that um, ethnic history. So the dominant culture has these characteristics I just shared with you and worthiness um, or citizenship and belonging in Fargo was then defined by these characteristics because people were used to them. So uh, we've seen across the country a rural to urban migration, um, but when the people from rural North Dakota moved to Fargo, there wasn't this you know huge difference in who they were. They might have been you know they they might have known more about farming, but they still had this kind of Scandinavian background. They were mostly white. Um, and things like that. But when refugees started coming, people saw them as new forms of diversity um, and um, would measure them against these um, dominant understandings of whiteness, like the main citizens are supposed to be white. And if you're not white, you're gonna be compared to Native Americans and you're supposed to be nice. And so some of the comments that I heard from both white people and from refugees were, refugees would say things to me like, um, I don't understand why people keep smiling at me. Um, you know, why are these people like strangers smiling at me? They don't know me, it's weird. And then um, people, the, the white people in North Dakota would say things like, well, I don't really trust the refugees because they never smile, especially the ones from Africa. They're just not smiling at me. Um, so these are cultural differences that I think a lot of people just don't think about. Um, and I've given a talk in North Dakota since I published this book. And I think um, college students and some other people from around there, you know, are a bit taken aback. Like, what well, you mean, we're not supposed to smile at people? Um, and that's not really the, the message here. It's just that if people don't smile back, it might not be because they, they don't like you. It's because that's not um, something that is common in their culture. Um, the other way that niceness is measured is through small talk. Um, uh, small talk is a very uh, important thing. Small talk about weather, small talk about everything. Um, people will ask you personal questions um, and you're expected to answer them in a friendly manner. And if you don't, you're seen as rude. Uh, so a lot of refugees from around the world were seen as rude in Fargo. Um, and again, of course, Christian values are gonna be uh, uh, dominant. Language is important. People who have accents were seen as um, of odd. So I spent a lot of time translating from English to English when I was a case worker or a researcher because people are not accustomed to hearing accents and so uh, couldn't really understand them. Um, and then if people can't be understood, they're not seen as, uh, as worthy of a citizen. Um, and again, uh, the work ethic bolstered by the low unemployment rate, uh, so many people told me that they believed strongly that people in, in North Dakota worked harder than people in other parts of the country. Um, and for me, that was very tied to ideas about the Protestant work ethic and to whiteness. If most of the people are white and most of the people are, they were Catholic and Protestant, but um, I think those two things uh, went together. Um, and then socioeconomic status would matter depending on uh, where people came from, how much education they had, um, how much knowledge about the world they had, um, could be seen as off-putting. And so I met a lot of uh, people, especially from Bosnia, who came from an upper 
class, if you will, um, in the former Yugoslavia, very well-educated professionals who had college degrees, spoke multiple languages, and they'd be working in um, low-wage, low-skill sectors with people born and raised in North Dakota who really looked down on them because they were refugees. Um, and um, if they would challenge those ideas, challenge the stereotypes, and, and then they were seen as, um, as even less worthy. Um, I talked to at least three different uh, Bosnians who, before they quit their job, they would go, they went to the, 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 the colleagues who were giving them a hard time and said, told them off basically before they quit. Um, and so socioeconomic status, not just if it's lower than the people in Fargo, but if it was higher, then there's gonna be some conflict there on an everyday level. But all of that, Fargo has learned so much about how to resettle refugees, which is why I think um, in, um, that people in Muncie can learn from them. Um, I think the changes in resettlement from the 80s to 2016 is worth commenting on. Um, I think that in the early, late 90s and early 2000s, it was the public institutions that were most against refugee resettlement. Um, they were saying, we don't have the capacity as, as workers, as teachers, as social workers, as police officers to handle people um, who don't speak English. So one police officer said, you know, I'm, I'm accustomed if I pull somebody over, you know, it'll take me 20 minutes to give them a ticket, to run a background check, to do this. But now I've got people that I pull them over, they don't speak English, they don't have the proper registration or driver's license, and now it's gonna take me an hour to two hours. And one way that that became kind of uh, ingrained in everyday life is that uh, police officers started to pull people over because they thought that refugees were driving without license and registration, which did happen. And it's important to acknowledge that. Now, of course, all, all refugees were not doing that. So police officers would pull them over. Um, and then, um, the, for example, the men from South Sudan who are Black would say, we're being racially profiled. And a lot of them, some of them did have license and registration and some of them didn't. So all these things get entwined with uh, racial profiling versus not following the rules and so on. Um, so again, it was the public institutions, not the public, that were the most vocal uh, challengers to resettlement in Fargo in the early um, 2000s and late 90s. But in the teens, particularly in 2015 and 2016, there was a noticeable rise in acts of uh, white supremacy and violence. And there was flyers posted around Fargo um, that were against refugees. People came up with a uh, change.org petition to end all refugee resettlement to North Dakota, claiming that they were too expensive, they were costing the state too much money, which I'll talk about in a minute. So these, uh, by the time 2015 and 2016 had come around, these public institutions like schools and, and law enforcement and uh, social workers had come around and they had changed their practices to accommodate and welcome refugees. Um, this woman here, for example, is a city planner in Fargo and she uh, was part, uh, helped to write a grant to make uh, Fargo more re welcoming uh, for refugees. Um, and it was the public outcry in the 20 teens that became uh, the marker. And to me, that says a lot about our political situation in the United States right now, um, including um, the rise of more violent white supremacy. Not that it ever went away, but it's, uh, it's re-emerging in new and different and uh, scary ways. Uh, but it also speaks to um, the role of public institutions and, and how important they are. Um, I will show, um, in Fargo schools in the 1980s, they would, they, one guy told me that they slammed these books on the table and they said, if you wanna bring refugees to Fargo, you can school them because we don't wanna spend money on textbooks for refugees that we never asked for. And by 2016, students in Fargo schools spoke 71 different languages and represented 60 different languages and teachers, um, uh, you know, especially ELL or ESL teachers, 
um, were raving about their students, um, and they had really done a good job of writing grants and incorporating um, English language, uh, English as a second language students into their schools. And this is also true. All of these patterns are also very similar in Sioux Falls, which I've uh, been following all of these years. So I want to just like speak to the the hard work and dedication of the, the, the people in these institutions that work to get their, their colleagues uh, to come around. The same with the welfare agency that was uh, initially really opposed vocally um, and would write letters in the newspaper saying, stop bringing refugees here. Um, by the time the director who did that, who wrote those public letters against resettlement retired, she said one of the things that she would miss most about her job was working with refugees. And that individual would go on to serve in the North Dakota state uh, legislature as a representative from Fargo, um, who would be fighting not only for refugee rights, but for the rights of other people who are um, poor, disenfranchised, minoritized, and so on. Um, so we have seen the rise of xenophobia and populism as well as new forms of commoning. Um, and by commoning, I use commoning as a verb uh, to stress the active practices that people need to do in order to connect with people from different backgrounds. And that's not, not just people who are born and raised in the United States and refugees. It can be um, people of different sexualities, people of different genders, people of different religions. Um, and I'm a, I'm a pretty big component of that concept of, of commoning because I think that talking to one another, telling each other stories, goes a long way. Um, unfortunately, I didn't bring a picture because I don't know if I have one, but one great story that I have, uh, a couple of them actually from Fargo, is that um, uh, the man who wrote the petition to end refugee resettlement to North Dakota, which got over 3,000 signatures, um, he was just angry. He was so angry about refugee resettlement. Um, and his friend encouraged him to sign up for a storytelling seminar, which is sort of like the facing project. It wasn't called the facing project, but it was basically the facing project where you tell your story to somebody else and then they have to repeat it back. And so this man joined the storytelling and he was paired with a refugee from the Democratic Republic of Congo, I believe. And this, uh, this individual from the Congo had come to the United States as a refugee, got US citizenship, started his own computer business and was doing very well from him, for himself. And he was paired with this guy named um, Damon. Um, and when they found out who the other was paired with, they were both kind of taken aback. They were like, what are we gonna do? Um, and, you know, the guy, Damon, uh, sat through part of it, but he didn't sat through the whole thing. He left early. Um, but some of these new Americans didn't let him off the hook. A friend of mine who's from Somalia decided that she was going to follow him, um, and get him to listen to her. And so she invited him over to dinner at her house and he went and she, um, laboriously explained to him, um, you know, why refugees coming to Fargo can be a good thing for him too. And what she found out from him is that he was raised in a deeply, deeply abusive, um, kind of cultish, like a Christian cult family. And he had to emancipate himself from his family. Um, and then hit rock bottom, was addicted to drugs and alcohol, served time in prison, and then kind of, you know, remade himself as, uh, as a new person. And so he was coming at it from a very individualistic perspective of like, look at where I came from, and nobody gave me anything. Um, and so they, they both talked about their difficult backgrounds. I don't know that he's a huge advocate for refugees yet, but I think that those kind of storytelling programs are really important. And I know that a lot of people on this call have done um, similar um, uh, programs and, and seen results from that. And then the other uh, story that comes to mind is that um, uh, two, uh, three young teenage Somali women were sitting in a car in a parking lot at, in a grocery store. And um, there was a bit of a parking dispute with this white woman and the, and the white woman just started screaming at them, you know, saying the most horrific things. You Muslims go back to where you came from and I hate you all and uh, used expletive terms, uh, terrorism terms. And the young women, um, you know, started filming her. They called her fat. They said, you don't know what you're talking about. You're stupid. Um, and it resulted in this major altercation. Um, and then the young women posted it online and people got really upset at the white woman and she ended up getting fired from her job in Fargo. 
Um, and then the police chief decided to get involved. He said, this is ridiculous. Fargo is getting a lot of bad press about this. We need to bring these people together. So he brought the young women from Somalia and the white woman together. He facilitated a conversation and um, the young woman found out that this woman's husband, uh, uh, sorry, father was killed in Iraq during the I Iraq war. Um, and this woman had never met anyone from Somalia or anyone really from um, probably another country before, especially not someone who was Muslim um, and who wore a hijab. So um, she heard how difficult it was for them to live in Fargo and that, you know, they get tired of people commenting on their, uh, ch their chosen dress and their, uh, their chosen religion. Um, and she had never heard that perspective before. And in this case, they actually did end up becoming friends. Like they, um, you know, the, the young Somali students invited the, uh, her to their house for Ramadan. Um, and then she invited them for Christmas and they actually um, became friends. And there's stories like that all over the place. And so I think there's a lot, uh, a lot that we can learn from that. But there's still a lot of misconceptions, I think. And um, I just wanted to address a few of those. Um, there's a very common misconception that refugees drain public resources, and that is demonstrably false. Many different studies in many different places in the United States have shown that over time, um, maybe not in the first year, they might use more public resources in that very first year, but over time, especially if you take that over a period of 20 years, refugees on average will make more money and contribute more to the public coffers than the average American citizen. Refugees also, um, the, at least in Fargo, there was this common misconception that refugees don't have to pay taxes and that's just not true. So a lot of the Bosnians would hear that and they would get so mad and they were some of the ones that would show their colleagues the paycheck and say, look, I pay taxes just like you do. You don't know what you're talking about. And they would get you know, just mad about that. Um, a lot of people think refugees and immigrants are taking our jobs. Um, and that's also not true. We know right now, just do a quick Google search, even here in Muncie, we have low um, unemployment rates right now. There's a labor shortage in a lot of places. Um, and so uh, that is not, uh, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation like refugees and immigrants come here and that, that takes jobs away. Um, what kind of rights do refugees uh, um, or in this case, Afghan humanitarian par parolees have? If you are a bona fide refugee, like you have been accepted as a refugee or um, our new uh, neighbors uh, from Afghanistan, they are immediately uh, legally able to work. They're um, legally able to get a social security card. Unfortunately, it takes um, some time to get those social security cards. Um, and so they, a lot of employers don't wanna hire them until they get the social security cards. And we're seeing that as a problem in Muncie right now, even though they, they are legally able to work, they can't really prove that until they get the card. Um, they also are legally able to get uh, some forms of welfare, including um, the supplement, supplementary nutrition, nutritional assistance um, or food stamps. Um, they are um, those who are eligible, for example, a single parent with children would be eligible for TANF and other state programs like that. Um, and so I have gotten into arguments with some people that um, insist that, you know, immigrants and refugees are coming here to, to live off of the, the welfare state. Um, and that's just not true. I've talked to um, our new neighbors, even here in Muncie, who have said, we're not looking for government handouts. We just want to get a job. We want to make a living. We want to, we want to provide for our families. Um, and so I think most uh, refugees and immigrants are not interested in that. Um, they're interested in, in you know, living a, a good life, including a, a fulfilling life with a job. Um, another thing I hear is that I think there's understandable um, I think love and desire for support uh, to uh, support our, our new neighbors. Um, but people that get involved in refugee resettlement sometimes um, are, are maybe not doing it for as altruistic reasons. There's these ideas that refugees are poor and they're helpless and they, they can't survive without us. Um, and so many of our, our, our new, new neighbors have come through multiple different countries. They might, but not always speak different languages. There's a wide variation in background and education. Um, and so they're a very, very diverse, heterogeneous group. Um, and some of them need more support than others. Um, but a lot of them want to live a self-sufficient and independent life. Um, and they don't necessarily need a team of people for a year. So it really does depend. There's not a one size 
fits all model for how to support these new neighbors. So I just want to end in talking a little bit more specifically about the Afghan humanitarian parolees. I've been saying that refugees is a political category and an economic or a, um, a legal category. So Afghan people, including myself, I refer to them as Afghan refugees sometimes, but they're not technically refugees. They're humanitarian parolees like the 130,000 plus um, Vietnamese that we accepted in 1975. And you can see this chart here that there hasn't been very many times in our history that we have accepted these large groups of people under that um, condition of humanitarian parolees. Um, but it happened after the Hungarian Revolution of 1957. So that would be an example of helping people who are voting with their feet against communism. Um, and then uh, the with US withdrawal from Vietnam and then the US withdrawal from Iraq and now the US withdrawal from Afghan Afghanistan. So we can see a clear pattern here um, that uh, the US military intervention has a lot to do with who we accept. Um, and you know we can talk about that um, later if you'd like. Um, but I guess I do stress this because I think um, as an anthropologist, and I think this is not just true in my uh, field, I think that what happens in another time and another place matters for us here and now. And there are a lot of examples and a lot of things that we can learn from these other examples. Um, the Vietnamese uh, refugees did not get as much support as maybe they needed. It was a pretty haphazard resettlement process. The Hungarians might have done a little bit better. There were fewer of them, but still a lot of them, but there was very little organized support and they sort of just um, made it on their own. Um, and then with Vietnamese, it was kind of haphazard. We were, we were still in that older model of being a primarily voluntary resettlement agency on a national level. Um, and you, when you get a fully volunteer organization, um, you get a real, mix of people. Um, so you get people coming in that are not necessarily trained in social work or know anything about the countries that our new neighbors are coming from that really mean well, but don't necessarily um, know what they're doing. And then you've got other people that do. And so um, I think there's issues here of responsibility and accountability that need to be taken into consideration. Um, but that said, um, I think it's, it's remarkable that the Muncie Afghan Refugee Resettlement Committee has formed. Uh, it started uh, by uh, Bibi Barami, who uh, under the umbrella of Awaken, which she also started. She's a remarkable, a remarkable woman. I'm sure all of you on the call or most of you have met her before. Um, so she and her husband, along with Julia Wadsworth, um, and Ashraf El Ez, who was a, a doctor here in Muncie, um, and their spouses got together, they started Mark, and they decided to call a public meeting uh, where some of us got together to talk about what we could do. Um, and so my role in the organization right now is to act as the liaison between Mark and the refugee resettlement agencies in Indianapolis. Uh, so I'm kind of the primary contact um, between them um, as we uh, figure things out. And the thing is that right now, even though this is not the first time in our history that we've accepted humanitarian parolees, it has been a really um, unorganized mess of um, how are we gonna get all of these refugees throughout the, the country. Um, and right now, I think that they are going to 46 states at least. I believe that uh, South Dakota and um, Montana are not accepting any of these um, these folks. Um, and right now, you know, we're we're trying to get even more families to come here. And uh, what's happened with the the resettlement agencies nationwide is that under the previous administration of of President Trump, um, he lowered the number of refugees that were allowed to come to the United States exponentially. They were the lower number, lowest numbers we've ever seen since the 1970s or before. Um, so in 2019, I think we accepted less than 20,000, and we were usually up between 60 and 80 on average. Um, and because of that, over those four years that he was in office, resettlement agencies across the entire country had to lay off workers because there were no refugees coming, as you can imagine. So they were low, short staffed. And then we brought, you know, 60,000 Afghans here to already short staffed 
uh, agencies um, without a clear plan. So when the Afghans first were coming, they weren't going to be allowed to get food stamps or Medicaid um, or anything else. And then they changed their mind and said, okay, they can. Um, and so it's a bunch of people kind of backpedaling and, and forward pedaling and trying to figure what's out. Um, but it's not um, new and it's not surprising that a lot of refugee resettlement workers are burning out across the country right now because um, this is a really um, kind of crazy process. Um, but Mark is doing uh, remarkable things. And I think what we can learn at Mark and in Muncie that like, uh, uh, I want to acknowledge that we're part of a settler colonialism tradition. Um, we do also have a dominant white Christian population. However, um, you know, Muncie is 83% white or thereabouts. And there are, um, there are immigrants here. There are uh, a very strong African-American community here. And I think there's a lot of commonalities that we can build across these different groups of people across class and race and uh, religion. Um, we also do have a low unemployment rate. I've heard directly from the mayor at meetings that we have 600 jobs available in Muncie right now. Um, and this administration is very anxious to bring uh, refugees here to uh, fill in that labor gap, which was similar to Fargo. Um, the politicians, um, at least um, in the 90s and 2000s, were like, yes, bring them here. We need workers. Um, and so my, my say there is yes, they have an economic impact. Yes, they want jobs, but also they will bring um, so many important immeasurable social contributions to this, this community. Um, so if you want resources, I would say that we all can help build these public private partnerships that stress uh, a participatory citizenship. So instead of assuming or thinking that we know what's best for this group of people, we ask them. Um, we ask them, what, you know, what do you need? How can I help you? Um, emphasize immigrant and refugee contributions to our political landscapes, not just the economic, but also the social and the political. Um, emphasize the common good and our commonalities. And don't forget to donate to Mark if you haven't already, because we can use your contributions. Um, in conclusion, I want to just um, share with you my favorite poster in Fargo, uh, which they came up with, and it, it has a, a picture of Moscow, London, Paris, and, and Fargo, and I crossed out Fargo here and put Muncie, um, because I'd like to think of Muncie as a global city. Um, I think of us as, um, as an anthropologist, again, I'm always trying to think global, and we are all global. We're global through our global food chains. We're global through the food that we eat. Uh, we're global through our interactions over the internet, through our media, um, because we have traveled abroad and people from um, other parts of the world have come here. And so instead of thinking of refugees as bringing new forms of diversity, I would, in, I would think of them as building on an already global city. And with that, I'm going to stop talking and stop sharing, and I'd be happy to take questions or comments. I did a lot of talking. And I would understand if you're all very tired and <laughs> you are not up for questions or discussion. No, I, I think that you overwhelmed us with the wealth of information uh, that you just <laughs> that, that, that you just shared with us. Uh, so uh, Elizabeth Agnew has her hand in the air already, so she's going to start the question hey. period. Well, I'll actually turn my camera on. I'm, I'm here. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks, Jen. That was a great talk. I'm so just happy to hear about your book. I've been knowing about it for a while. I was really intrigued to have you uh, kind of articulate the distinction between refugees and humanitarian parolees. And that kind of makes sense to me. But one of the things, having done work with the Muslim community here, one of the things that also struck me in your, I think it was your opening bar graph, was that you did not include, um, it appeared that you did not um, include um, folks from the kind of region of the Middle East at all, whether, I, how, and I realize that's even a problematic term. Yeah. Um, but I and, and then later you did mention them as humanitarian um, parolees, but it did seem that people in that category did make make it under your earlier chart. So I just was kind of curious about how you're thinking about those categories. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I am. Um, let's see if I understand your question correctly. Yes. Yeah, some of the graphs that I shared, they do. I didn't, I didn't create the graph. So I don't know if you saw the source on there. I was pulling from the UNHCR United Nations high commissioner for refugees and okay. they do, they problematically, you know, they're thinking globally in these very broad categories. Um, and I believe that the middle East is even considered as part of Asia in their graphs. Okay, I wondered, yeah, okay. Which is, of course, problematic. Um, and so I didn't group it that way, but I think it's a, it's definitely a fair uh, thing to bring up right right now. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I would have liked, I was actually searching just for this talk because my, my specialty is more in Bosnia and South Sudan because I compare Muslim Bosnians to, you know, Black Christian Southern Sudanese. Um, but just to provide that overview, I was curious um, about getting all the different countries. And it's actually harder to find than you might think because they're thinking just in terms of this regionalism that is really problematic. Um, and I decided that it wasn't worth um, digging down the rabbit hole of trying to find this information just for this talk, but I actually do want to know, and I'd love to find that list. Um, yeah. And it would speak a lot to global political dynamics, of course, to get my hands on that list. Yeah, thank you. And just as a, just a quick follow up to that. So there's, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Thanks for just explaining that. But all, and I'm also just kind of curious. Do you so in Muncie with Mark here? Um, I mean, are there things that immediately seem salient to you about how communities respond to people who are kind of categorized in these different ways? I mean, I'm sure there are different processes of admission into the country and visas and this, that, and the other, but are there, for those of us on the ground who are aware of Mark or maybe involved with Mark, are there, um, I really like what you said about the kind of thinking about, I guess it's kind of engaged citizenship, but are there, is that different, is that different salient for us in some ways? Yo, definitely. Um, definitely. I'm, I'm kind of thinking through this, like I'm not, I'm, I'm involved with Mark right now as an advocate, um, more than a researcher at this point. Um, and I would definitely be asking Mark before I would to, to embark on any sort of research, but I would say, um, that the thing that I, I really love that we're working on is that there, I think I want to see more training, um, I think that people do want to get involved, but there are, there is definitely, and I'm not, I'm not talking about Muncie now, but in my work with refugees more broadly, there's definitely a, a desire to help, 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 help. And I think um, to just kind of say, oh my gosh, that's great. I know you want to help, but let's talk about ways that you can help um, that doesn't infantilize um, you know, these are grown adults who have survived war. They've had children in refugee camps. I mean, these people know how to survive and they should be um, credited for that. Now, that's mm -hmm. not saying that people don't need some assistance. There's people who need medical assistance. There's people who need language assistance. Um, but I don't, I don't think that we, um, you know, and there's a long uh, tradition of this, of, of you yeah. know, and it's not just with refugees. I mean, we can talk about people who want to help people who are homeless in similar ways that want to say, we know it's best for you. We know how to make the decisions for you. You clearly are here because you don't make good decisions or something like that. And I just think that if we can try to, to get ahead of the game and the, the issue with this particular um, humanitarian parolee situation is that there hasn't been time. In an mm -hmm. ideal world, you plan far ahead for all these things. And one of the things I'm seeing now is I'm in the middle of this, this, um, I don't know, this process of resettling these, um, these families is that, you know, we don't necessarily need the academic to come along and say, here's how you have to do things, but it's really hard for me not to do it sometimes. I'm sure any, any of the Mark people listening can be like, oh yes, she's the pessimist. Um, but I do think that, you know, we can learn from other times and other places. And, um, and then um, we have to be willing to get in there and not just critique, but to get, get in there and say, okay, um, this is hard work and um, somebody needs to do it. Um, arguably. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Matt? Thank you. Matt? Matt Hotham? Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Really um, interesting 
uh, stuff here. And I think, um, you know, what was what was really helpful, I think, for me in thinking through what Muncie might experience in this moment is, um, was your list of like, frequent presuppositions about uh, refugees and immigrants that and, and the way that they are often wildly incorrect. Um, I can only imagine how frustrating it must be to be someone who, you know, owned your own business or had a PhD in your home country and to right. come here and be told by, you know, a 20 year old that you're garbage and you're not as intelligent as them. Um, one, one question, I, I don't know if you have an answer, or maybe we can think through it together is in refuting some of the stereotypes or attempting to overcome some of the stereotypes, there's in some ways almost an an implied insult to the local community, right? And you mentioned that in uh, in passing about how when people oppose this infantilization, it sometimes creates a backlash. But even just the argument like they're here to take our jobs or uh, they're here to be on public assistance, like the easy answer you gave to that is, no, they're here because your community is desperate for bodies, probably because it's in demographic decline. Um, and that's also likely to produce a backlash, right? So I'm wondering if you can yeah. think about like, how are some ways that we encounter these mm -hmm. or oppose these presuppositions that don't set the local community in a defensive crowd? Oh, yeah, right? I love that question. I mean, I think that's a great question for people who teach on this kind of stuff, too, is that... Um, um, and I did, I actually think it's good to point out that my answer to that, when I brought it up, I saw the time and I was like, I got to move on, but you can't just say, oh, that's not true. <laughs> like, like, that's just a dumb answer. That's a lazy answer, honestly. Right. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think that showing the research, um, is going to do it like, oh, I have research to show that actually they, they're going to contribute a lot. Um, yeah, that's good luck with that. Right. Um, but I do think it's the stories um, but one of the issues that I have with the whole storytelling thing is that people have to be willing to come to the table. And one, I don't want to force new neighbors to tell their story. And a lot of people also want that. And I call it, it's like compassion pornography. It's like we, and I, I do talk about this in my book, like we want to hear the sorriest story so that we can feel better about ourselves for helping you. Um, and I just get really angry at that. Um, because I know Bosnians, especially, they were just like, uh, yeah, no, we're not going to talk to you. Like, good, no, bye. Uh, and Southern Sudanese that I worked with were like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, are you? we're ready. Here we go. We can do it. Because they, they got a lot of uh, really good um, things out of it. When Sudanese would tell their stories, people would be like, oh, let us give you money. Oh, my God. Your life is so much better here. Are you not so lucky? Uh, and I have already heard that coming from some people in Muncie saying they should just be grateful. They shouldn't be so mm -hmm. Um, and so how to talk to people like that without also forcing the new neighbors to have to come out and like tell their story, I think is where I have really tried to wonder like, yeah, what is my role here? So one way I've tried to address that, Matt, and I don't know that it's also going to reach the people that you're talking about, is that I've been working with the library at Ball State and with um, librarians at all of the universities in Indiana. So I got on to the people from IU and Purdue were there. And I put together a lib guide that I, I really loved the lib guide that people put together about um, African Americans. And I was like, well, we need that for refugees, especially since that these Afghans are coming all over the country, and people don't know where to turn for resources. And so I'm working with the librarians to come up with resources, and most of them are not academic. I do have my whole academic list because I love my academic lists, but a lot of them are also just popular, like who are refugees? How do they get here? And, you know, I think if we can start like trying to trickle down the education where, um, you know, if somebody, I don't know, you know, I'm an educator, so I like the idea of educating, but I think on a one-to-one -one level, it just comes down to like, um, instead of like trying to go against facts, it takes time and it takes um, um, some sort of emotional uh, plea that if I could talk to people and I could get in a room with somebody for like an hour to an hour and a half, that would help. I probably can't change somebody's mind in five minutes. You know, I, I don't know that I can actually do that, but I appreciate your question. Thank you for that, Jen. Uh, I, have, I have a question myself. Uh, actually, I have a lot of questions about the refugee category as a political or legal category, uh, but the, the the thing that I think is most relevant for this conversation now is to ask you about 
how that difference impacts the the migrant population in terms of all the all these resettlement issues that you're talking about. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, you mean like because of the humanitarian parolee designation? Right. Um, I, they're coming through the resettlement agency. So it's not separate from the re refugee resettlement in this case. And I don't, neither were the Vietnamese. So they're in large part, they're being treated like refugees. Is that me? Or what was your question? No, 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 no. I, I'm actually, sorry, I was, I was not specific enough. Uh, I'm actually thinking of the Latin American populations at the Southern oh. border, right? So this, all these things that we're talking about, they're just non-existent yeah. because yep. of that, that legal category. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, I have a lot to say about that. I would actually <laughs> love to do like a faculty learning community about this because I, I say I, I speak a lot about refugees, but I I feel like it's isolating the people at our southern border who I believe should be considered refugees. They should be able to uh, apply for asylum and become a bona fide refugee. Um, and it's not happening because of politics. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know how we can, can change that category, but like, I'm trying to say more and I'm, I'm thinking about wanting to write something about like the Haitians and that were there at the same time they were at our Southern border when Afghans were being flown into the country. I'm not against help, uh, you know, supporting and bringing in, um, Afghan families, but I do think that there's something to be said about this very clear distinction between Haitians fleeing from political violence that was also in part, not fully though, um, caused by you know, United States um, um, and other uh, Western uh, countries. And so I, I appreciate the question, Kevin. And the thing about um, immigrants is when they do get here, they do not have the legal rights that refugees do. Refugees can apply for TANF and food stamps and Medicaid and immigrants can't. And I've gotten into to Facebook arguments and I stopped doing that because it doesn't make any, it doesn't help. Um, and saying, I can show you, they, they do not get food stamps here. They, if you're an immigrant, um, undocumented immigrant, um, you don't have access to all of those state resources and you are relying all on NGOs and non-governmental organizations, nonprofit organizations with, and refugee resettlement agencies are supported by the government and private organizations, but these other organizations, not so much. So there's fewer resources, fewer rights, less recognition for your um, everything, you know? Um, but I also noticed that in, in, in Fargo anyway, a lot of people don't know the difference between refugees and immigrants. So even if refugees are here legally, they're still treated illegally. Um, so there's that. So what about ethnic kinship? Uh, is there such a thing for refugee communities, uh, like other obvious relationships of kin kinship between Afghan refugee, Afghan uh, asylum seekers and whomever? It's both. it's both. I mean, I kind of think of it like imagine like, you know, 60,000 um, random Americans end up in Afghanistan. Are they all going to be friends? Guess, you know, like, no. Um, there are really big differences in levels of education in all the countries that I've lived in and worked in, um, you know, there's huge urban rural divides um, and people from the cities do not want anything to do with the people that came from the country. Um, and so in addition to education, there are religious differences. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, Matt could talk about this, Elizabeth, more than I could, but um, there's different um, kinds of, of Islam in Afghanistan. Everybody does not have the same belief system. Um, and on the other hand, um, there's people that have come together that they're like, we know that we don't bond together in Fargo as Southern Sudanese would be the example that we're not going to get the kind of rights we have to. So we have to, we have to, overlook our long list of differences and somehow say that our home nation matters here. Otherwise, um, we're going to get eaten up by, you know, white supremacy and whatever. Excellent. Thank you. I do have some follow-ups, but Jeff Fry has his hand. Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, are there any records of numbers of people who leave the U.S. and claim refugee status in other countries? I don't know anything about... Um, the actually claiming refugee status. I just know of people that are considered expats all over the world who have fled the United States because they're trying to get away from our, our political climate. Um, but I don't, I have not heard of anybody trying to claim refugee status other than people who came here from other countries who don't like it here and try to get to Canada and vice versa. 
Um, some people in Canada think the U.S. is better, and some people in the U.S. think Canada is better, and you know they talk to one another and try to figure out where it's best. But yeah, it's an interesting question. So there are longitudinal patterns that are familiar from to some of us from you know immigrant histories about assimilation into American mainstream. Uh, do refugee uh, communities follow a sim similar pattern or are there like differences that we should be aware of? I think the biggest differences are more recently, like, um, you know, if you go back to like my family history of Norwegians or whatever, like they came so long ago that they couldn't keep in contact with their, their people because they came on ships and they wrote letters. And after a while, you're just like, eh, I'm American. I'm not going to deal with this long distance nationalism stuff anymore. Um, but today, I think a lot of people, they might not get dual citizenship, but like I know Southern Sudanese and Bosnians that are constantly going back to visit as soon as the violence is peaceful enough, they want to go back. Um, some Bosnians have moved back. Some I know personally Southern Sudanese who have moved back. Um, and some have done it without citizenship because they're just sick of living um, in the United States. Um, whereas others, I did not study the 1.5 generation as much as I would have liked. Um, um, because it was just too much for me to do in one project. Um, but certainly there's in all these communities, there's some challenges between parents and children with wanting to, you know, raise them in more traditional ways. And then the kids come and they learn American ways and there's going to be tension there. But um, um, I can't, I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but I definitely have seen it. Um, so there's a sense of it being temporary for certain communities, certain certain members of certain communities? I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can think of very many people who came here for just a couple of years, but like Bosnians will save their money um, for a long time and they'll be like, well, I'm gonna retire and buy a house in Bosnia um, and then they'll move back and then maybe they'll come back to the US to visit people here, but they can be more mobile now than they could during the war or after it. So um, yeah, I don't know. Excellent. We have, uh, we've passed 630. We've gone a little over time. If, if anybody has an urgent question, uh, I, I ask you to, to raise your hand quickly. Otherwise, we're just going to have a show of appreciation for our wonderful speaker. Um, yeah, I think, uh, okay. Oh, that's a clap, not a hand raise. So, uh, you know, again, um, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's been, thank you. uh, it's been a wonderful talk, but it's, it's, I also want to acknowledge that it was long overdue that we invited you uh, to be a big questions, big idea speaker. You're very much a respected teacher and researcher on campus, so uh, we're glad to have you. And uh, I know, I, speaking for myself, I learned a lot, and the comments seem to be effusive with praise also. So again, one final Thank you all so much. I love hearing the birds in the background. It's so nice. <laughs> there are that, that's me. I've been trying to time my, my moments where I unmuted my mic for when they're, when they're quiet. I needed to be next to them because of my charger is here. And yeah. You know. <laughs> yep. yep. No, I love it. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Have a great weekend and uh, be in touch. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Erickson, for being a wonderful speaker. And I'd like to appreciate uh, thanks to Kevin Harrelson from the Ball State Department of Philosophy, as well as everyone who's joined in with our seminar for tonight. And those of us who are gonna be watching it on Facebook Live later on. To, later on. Uh, we'll be taking a small break with big questions, big ideas, but please keep an eye on our events calendar at munciepubliclibrary.org for more information as to when our next seminar will be. But until then, have a good night, everybody.